Hopefully I'm going to give you a bit of a talk uh, still just about this morning um, about um, psychological health and, um, and um, something that I'm obviously quite passionate about and uh, I'll leave you with some messages about the challenges that I think I've faced as I've uh, gone through this journey. Um, my current job at the moment is I'm the Defence Professor of Mental Health, that means that I look at all our, our troops and try and help uh, decide how mad they are, whether they're more or less mad than they were before they went away. Um, many people think that Going away to Afghanistan or other strange places might make you mad um, in the first place, but I, I would obviously argue um, quite differently. Um, many years ago, I did think about joining the army. I thought long and hard about it, but I realised that the Navy was definitely the right place. <laughs> and before you think that life's too easy in the Navy, that water would be quite cold sometimes. <laughs> Actually, it's an aircraft carrier, and it's clearly not going to last. We don't have any, but I won't turn into financial restrictions. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about, traumatic stress, uh, about what organisations can do about it, and this is mostly about the military, but you'll see it actually has great application, I think, to the uh, National Health Service as well, and then the challenge. So why bother doing anything about traumatic stress? Well, the first is the uh, principle of proportionality, and that basically means that the more that you take away from people, the more you need to give them. So for our troops who are out in Afghanistan, who really don't get the chance to wander downtown to get a pint of beer or to um, sit with their loved ones and, and talk to them, because they don't have those um, access to normal support mechanisms, we need to make sure that they have excellent support mechanisms when they're uh, deployed to horrible places. Um, another important issue is the issue of legality. And, and um, nothing really concentrates uh, big organisations' minds more than having a good legal case against them. Um, the MOD was sued in 2002 and 2003. The court case uh, was dramatic, it went on for over a year, and it was in the High Court. Um, that the, um, uh, Mr J, who's currently doing the Leveson inquiry, was, uh, was on the side of the MOD, and there were some very strong and powerful arguments made uh, about whether the MOD had done enough to support um, its staff uh, over the years. Um, lots of experts came up on stage, um, the, uh, the legal team gave a very hard time, I think it caused them a certain amount of distress. And although the MOD won the case uh, overall, it, it didn't win it because it had a star study fabulous system, it won it because it met the legal minimum standard. And these are very different things, legal minimum standards aren't the same as necessarily providing high quality care. But in having won the case, um, they looked forward and said, what do we need to do to make sure that if there's another case brought against us, they assumed there probably would be, that they would be able to defend it in the future. And the three main things that they needed to do, in their view, was they needed to do more research uh, to find out what the state of the problem was. They needed to make sure that people in positions of responsibility, managers, commanders, could spot the signs of who's in, uh, who's got problems. And they needed to be able to change the culture. Um, and as you're probably aware, and um, we've heard a bit this morning already, culture change takes time. Now, the MOD didn't want to go towards a culture where you would be saying, Anyone had to go to war today? No, no, okay, well, if you go there. <laughs> but in a culture where it's just as okay to put your hand up and say you've got a mental health problem as it is to say you've had a physical health problem. And certainly in, a, in an armed forces sense, if you were wandering down the, uh, the passageway of a ship or uh, across a base and you were dragging a bleeding leg, I am wholly confident that one of your colleagues would say, you know, mate, what's wrong with your leg? You need to get yourself down to the medical centre. However, if you're wandering along the same place and you're looking a bit dreary, and your mind's uh, distracted and you're not very communicative. I'm not so sure that, certainly back in the, um, in the time this court case went on, that people would have prodded you to go against some help. Now, one of the topics that was talked about in the court case, which is relevant, um, is the screening. I don't know if you recognise this chap. Um, it's General Marshall, who's famous for lots of reasons. The Marshall Plan, you may have heard of in the Second World War. But he's famous because um, of a screening project that he had no idea that he was uh, looking into. In 1939, if you wanted to join the US Army, you had to see a mental health professional. You had to go and see this person, and they would decide whether you were made of the right stuff. <coughs> if you weren't deemed to be tough enough, you weren't allowed to join. By 1943, they'd run out of people, and it was General Marshall who overturned the screening program, and basically said all those people who were screened as being vulnerable were allowed to join the military. In fact, I suspect they were probably persuaded to join the military rather than were just allowed. And what they found is that in people who were screened as being tough, about one in ten of them broke down in the war. So, but in people who were screened as being weak, about one in five of them broke down. So the screening program wasn't useless, but it really didn't um, um, do its job. It, it missed things 80% of the time. 
Um, we did a study at, at King's College London, um, basically doing a general Marshall type approach to the um, operations in Iraq. Now you're probably looking at numbers and thinking, oh my god, numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, but basically, um, we did a study where in 2002 we gathered a whole lot of data from UK military personnel before they deployed. We didn't do anything with that data. We let them deploy, they went to Iraq and did their stuff wandering around um, in the desert. And then they came back and we measured what their psychological health was like. And what we found is that in, before they deployed, 33 of them appeared to have mental health problems. And if you were screening, you wouldn't have sent those people away, you'd have sent them to them. But when they came back, only six of them still had problems, which suggests it's a very rate of about one in five, which is no different to how it was really in the, in the Second World War. And importantly for an organisation, there were 41 people that appeared to be perfectly okay before they went away, but when they came back, um, they were seen to have mental health problems. And so from an organizational point of view, if you take the National Health Service and you said, well, we're only going to employ staff who don't get stressed, that's less easy. So we'll do a less screening program, we'll only take all ones who don't develop mental health problems. Um, the thing is, you can't do it. It's a lovely concept, um, but um, we don't know how to do this really well. I used to think that if you were NASA, maybe NASA could uh, do screening. NASA, I guess, get 10,000 applicants for every um, place to, you know, to be an astronaut. I'm, I'm guessing it may be more than that. But this is the story of a poor female astronaut who drove many hundreds of miles wearing a nappy uh, to go and sort her partner's lover. Uh, astronauts wear nappies, apparently, it's quite normal in the astronaut world. Um, now, I don't blame the poor lady. We've all had, I'm sure, bits of our lives where emotions have kind of got in the way. But if NASA can't screen people as being tough enough uh, to join NASA, I don't think any other organisation has much of a chance of doing that. Something else to talk about here is the, the, the history of stigma. Um, stigma is something that sets you apart and makes you feel less worthy and you know, less credible uh, because there's something wrong with you. Um, this is the view of a guy called Captain Dunn, who was a well-decorated First World War medal officer um, in the War of the Lives. Now, if you were in Captain Dunn's unit and you were feeling a bit weepy or a bit distressed, I don't think you'd be going to see a doctor um, to try and get any help. And that was generally the view of the time in the First World War. The general's view was if you could just send us the right sort of people, we'd get on with this war. Move on to the Second World War. Many of you have heard of General Patton, who's a famous US general. He was well known to slap soldiers who had mental health problems. You may also have heard of black and gold fiber. That was a term introduced by the Royal Air Force for people who wouldn't fly their planes because they were frightened. In fact, they had good reason to be frightened. You had about a um, greater than 50% chance of being shot down in your first six missions. So not wanting to fly was entirely rational. But it was so, um, the need for people to fly was so desperate that if you wouldn't fly, uh, you were said to suffer with lack of moral fibre. Uh, your flying badges were taken off you, you were made to do a walk of shame, you were demoted, and you ended up cleaning out the trees. And it was so unpleasant, the stigma about having an LMF, that people would rather fly the planes and get shot down than they would um, suffer with LMF. Um, but this isn't all about, and, and things have changed, in case though, um, uh, things have changed. But this isn't all about um, military personnel. This comes from a study called the Adult Psychiatric Mobility Study. This was done in, in England um, and in 2007. And it was a wide ranging survey of telephone interviews uh, looking at the mental health of England rather than the UK. The Department of Health stuff will learn more about this than I will, about why it was England. And in that group of people, was uh, in that sample, it's called the Animal Psychiatric Mobility Study. There were some people who had post-traumatic stress disorder, which as you may know is a psychiatric condition that will come on as a result of being exposed to traumatic events. Now, the people in that study were asked whether they'd ever served in the military or not. And what this study shows you here is that this is all the people with PTSD. That whether you have been in the military or never been in the military, most people weren't getting any help at all. That was the most likely outcome. Um, so almost three quarters of uh, the people in that sample were getting absolutely no help at all, suffering from a significant mental health problem, um, but just sort of cracking on and trying to deal with it themselves. Um, and actually I can tell you that if you were looking at a pattern here for depression or for alcoholism or for uh, panic disorder, you would see very similar patterns. That most people who have mental health problems don't come and get any help. Not sure if you've read this report. Um, I often prescribe this. It's much more effective than sleeping tablets. Just two pages of this before bedtime will ensure a very good night's sleep. Now, in fact, I'm being unfair. It's an extremely good report, actually. It's a black report, and it's a report on work and health. Um, and in terms of work and health, there are a number of important patterns about uh, the impact of mental health on people's ability to do their job well. 
um, just some things here is that in 2008, a very significant number of days were lost because uh, people didn't turn up for work because of their had mental health problems. And that's absenteeism, which you've probably heard of. You may not have heard of the concept called presenteeism. But presenteeism is being at work, but actually not really being at work, because your mind's full of lots of other stuff, thinking about um, things uh, which um, are distressing or unpleasant. And as you can see here, that presenteeism is, is thought to, um, to probably account for one and a half times as much productivity loss as uh, absenteeism. And if you think about safety critical tasks, because obviously in the health service there's lots of safety critical tasks, as there are in, as there are in Afghanistan, we're trying to um, do some tasks out there. And safety critical tasks, if your mind's full of uh, traumatic memories or distressing thoughts, and you're not, and your, and your mind's not on the job, you have the potential to make some significant mistakes, which of course can lead uh, to have some very severe outcomes. Um, this is also from the Black Report, and this basically shows that um, year on year, uh, mental and behavioural problems are becoming more and more common. Um, so the good news for me as a psychiatrist is I think I've got a pretty secure job for the many years ahead. Um, so if people don't speak to medical personnel, they don't go and seek help, who do they speak to? This is a study you did at King's, and it's um, 1,200 uh, UK military personnel who had served in the Balkans, um, in former Yugoslavia. And when they came back from their deployment, we asked them lots of questions, um, but some of the questions were, about who did you seek help for? Who did you speak to when you came home? And you can see here that 97% of people in this military sample had sought help from the people they deployed with. So their colleagues who had shared the same experience with them. And note also that families are also quite high up. Only 8% of people sought help from welfare or medical services. So um, certainly within the military, we have a very good uh, mental health setup um, and we. Um, aim to provide you know, first rate, good, high quality care, but most people aren't getting their help from us. Most people are getting their help and support from their friends and colleagues that they serve. So this brings me on to um, a program called TRIM, um, and TRIM stands for Trauma Risk Management. And basically this is, uh, in the olden days, whatever the olden days were, the idea when something traumatic happened, you fly in someone like me, a mental health professional, who would come in sort of with our Superman outfit and you know, touch you on the forehead and you would all be cured through uh, instant counseling. But we know that that's a waste of time and it not only doesn't work, but it actually has the potential to make people worse. Lots of very good studies showing that single session debriefing, flying counselors in, is um, no good and actually makes people worse, published in journals like the Lancet and other high quality publications. So TRIM is a way instead of um, trying to get peers, people who work within the organisation to look after um, themselves. And basically we're not able to cure people, we don't know how to prevent people developing mental health problems, but we do know that detecting them early means we can get them to appropriate treatment. It's first conceived in 1996 within the, uh, the War Marines, um, I'm not sure how much you know about the military, but the War Marines are an elite uh, group of um, naval soldiers, um, many Marines don't like to be associated with the Navy, but if you, they ever tell you they're not, they're not in the Navy, just ask to see their ID card and it says Royal Navy on the top. Um, and so Marines being sort of roughly toughy types, I um, like to think that they're sort of pretty tough, but the, uh, the guy in charge of the Marines back in the uh, late 90s spotted that a number of his troops were having problems. And through a iterative process, TRIM was what came out of it. Um, and basically it's uh, a system where you would train non-medical professionals within the unit how to do the psychological first aid and how to spot people who need additional support. And it's now used by a number of other organisations, BBC, Foreign Office, and also some, some health services and emergency services. Why use peers? Peers understand the language. So I don't know how much you have about the military again, but if, you, if you're a Marine, um, you don't, uh, when you have a drink, it's called a wet. If you're in the army, it's called a brew. Now, it doesn't seem like very much, but if you spend the whole time talking about wets so and I spend the whole time talking about brews, we don't click. Uh, again, in the Marines, if you go for a walk, you go for a yod. If you're in the army, you go for a walk, you go for a tab. It's all very silly language. But language is really important about making connections with people. And people won't talk to you about uh, important emotional stuff unless they feel you're on the same way. So peers understand the jargon and the ethos, and um, potential to reduce stigma because they're not medical. These are mates, these are people in the unit. Uh, they're readily available. We have about 10,000 troops out in Afghanistan. We have three mental health nurses and a psychiatrist who goes out for two weeks every three months. And so we were flying our mental health professionals around everywhere, they would be very busy. Um, Trim practitioners are distributed amongst all the units who are deployed and they're able to provide support as and when you need it. And there's a nice phrase here is that commanders like to consume their own smoke. 
and means they like to keep things within house and look after themselves. This is two true practitioners. I'm not sure what your view of counsellors were, but they probably don't look like this. Uh, the, now I know as a psychiatrist, if I turn up in the military and I go and see some people, they're like, oh, hi boss, we're really pleased to see you. I'm just a bit busy. Um, but, but when these guys turn up, they're just like the, the rest of the soldiers. They can sit down, have a beer, and wet, depending on who you're talking to, and they can talk about what's been going on. True practitioners aren't counsellors, they're not therapists, they don't do group hugs, at least they're not meant to. Um, they don't use safety cameras. It's not about being pink and fluffy. This is about providing people with practical support and assistance and then signposting them to get help if they don't get better. How do you do it? You run a two and a half day training course and then a further two day course for a trim team leader. We train people about how to do a simple psychological risk assessment. Um, we get them doing lots of role playing. And at the end of it, we take a staff off with sort of 20 soldiers who don't know much about trauma. And at the end of it, we end up with probably 70 or 18 soldiers who are quite good at chatting to their colleagues and spotting who's got problems. We published eight papers on trim now. Um, we haven't found penicillin. Uh, this isn't curing everyone of all their ills, but this is a good evidence-based package that um, I'm I'm very pleased to say it is being well used out in Afghanistan and protecting our, our troops at the moment. Challenges with this in the military are, and also other organisations is overcoming the idea that mental health is somehow a pink and fluffy thing. And the way that we managed to do that was by basically selling this in terms of operational efficiency. So we didn't go to commanders and say, oh, you're poor people, have got lots of mental health problems, we need to help them. What we said instead was, that's a presenteeism bit. You want to have your troops perform as best as you possibly can. And by using the system, you will maximise the operational efficiency. Suddenly, they're interested in what we have to talk about. The legal and economic arguments are also very good levers and gets people interested. And I have to be honest that the MLD court case was something that certainly concentrated uh, people's minds as to having to do something. And then importantly, from an academic point, uh, is getting the evidence to show that what you're doing works and publishing that in good peer-reviewed journals. That's me.